tonight's Bible readings from James chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. The corrosion, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. This is God's word. James certainly doesn't mince his words, does he? It's quite confrontational when you read through some of what he writes, um, and much of it is very practical. Now, if you will forgive me, I'm feeling a bit hot, so I'm going to switch this air conditioner on. I hope it's not on heat. Uh, that's on heat. Thank you for those who have served us by participating uh, in the music. For your faithful service, we appreciate it. And those who have prayed and done announcements, uh, we really appreciate all of your participation, communion, and our prayer. So thank you for serving us in that way. Let's pray. Our Father, you don't mince your words at times. You are quite straight and forthright with us. You confront us sometimes in areas that are difficult at times to process. Your word is penetrating. It goes right into the depths of our being. And we recognize that it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that you speak. And so we ask this evening, we plead with you, we implore you that the Holy Spirit might take your word and cause it to fall upon hearts that are open, minds that are open, that we would bring our lives in submission to the Lordship of Jesus, that as you strengthen us by your grace, we might be more and more conformed into your image, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Homer and Langley Collier were killed by one of the many booby traps they had to deter outsiders in their home. But their bodies were hidden in the tons of garbage and were not found for weeks. The brother's story began in the middle of the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, but ended in 1947 when they died side by side, buried under piles of rubbish that accumulated in a Manhattan row house. It's a fascinating story. Homer, the older of the two, was blind and was cared for by the younger brother, Langley, at the house in Harlem. Langley believed his brother's sight could be restored with a diet in vitamin C, so he fed Homer 100 oranges a week. Imagine that as a diet. In the meantime, Langley began keeping years' worth of newspapers so his brother could read them once his sight had been restored. That's blind faith for you. What started as a well-intended meaning but misguided gesture was escalated over the years into an out-of-control collection that engulfed their home and the brothers became recluses, prisoners in their own house. 
The extent of the brothers' junk collecting finally came to a head in March 1947, when the authorities received a tip-off that someone had died in the property. At first, it was near impossible to gain entry into the house. Tons of debris, including old newspapers, phone books, and furniture boxes, were slowly removed and, uh, from the front foyer, but the rescuers found themselves blocked out by walls of rubbish. It wasn't until the patrol office broke a window on the second floor and climbed through the first body uh, that the first body was discovered. After two hours spent climbing through junk and debris, the body of Homer was found lying among the boxes and trash, but his younger brother was nowhere to be seen. A massive hunt was launched, with the authorities searching as far away as Atlantic City in a bid to find the missing brother. Three weeks later, it dawned on them that he had been under the noses all along, according to Unclutter. The body of Langley was found just 10 feet away from where his older brother had died, but he was buried under tons of debris. The authorities discovered that Langley had actually been the first to die, killed by one of the many booby traps he had set up to deter outsiders from coming inside the house of junk. He had been bringing food to his older brother when it collapsed on top of him, crushing him to death. More than 100 tons of rubbish, including more than 25,000 books, were eventually removed from the house, with the authorities discovering an astonishing array of bizarre items collected by the Collier brothers. Among them were pickled human organs, hundreds of yards of unused silk and fabric, the folding top of a horse-drawn carriage, and the chassis of a Model T Ford. That accumulated all this stuff over years, had money to spare in the bank, yet died under clutter of rubbish. John Rockefeller said, I've made many millions, but they've brought me no happiness. W.H. van der Bilt said, The care of 200 million is enough to kill anyone. There's no pleasure in it. Jake, John Jacob Astor of the hotel chain said, I'm the most miserable man on the earth. Henry Ford said, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. And Andrew Carnegie said, millionaires seldom smile. All that glitters is not gold, or not all, that go uh, not all that's gold glitters. You know, the reality is that we live in a very decadent society. You know that. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. We live in a wealthy country. You would be surprised, or some of you won't be surprised, but some of you would be surprised to know that we are in the top 3% of the world in terms of our income. We have, per capita, in Australia, I bet you didn't know this, the biggest houses in the world. We are a country that is overflowing with wealth. And it's very easy for us to get sucked into that wealth, sucked into thinking, I need more stuff. It's easy to get sucked into wanting to accumulate, wanting the next thing, and buying and buying more and buying more and accumulating more, while others around the world starve. Yet James brings this to the forefront of our minds by reminding us that even though wealth is not necessarily a bad thing, the way that wealth is used can very easily be misused. And God condemns the misuse of wealth without exception. Moreover, James says to us, that the wealth are going to be judged by God, the wealthy. Now, at one level, 
when we read these verses, because it is primarily directed towards the unbelieving, James changes texture. So there's no call for repentance. He's not addressing the congregation now as brothers. But he is addressing the congregation in the sense that those within the congregation are being exploited by the wealthy and are suffering at the hands of the wealthy and are also being sucked into the desire to want to have wealth, to be like the wealthy. So what James is trying to say to them is don't look at these wealthy people who have, in fact, and are currently exploiting you and wish that you could have what they have, that wish that you could have the riches that they have access to. Because there's great danger and trouble fraught in being wealthy. Firstly, I want you to notice the impending judgment of the wealthy. Look at verse 1. The impending judgment of the wealthy. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon, upon you. He is not rebuking the wealthy because they are wealthy. We must understand that. God is not set against people who have got lots of money. God doesn't condemn wealth per se. Some of God's saints were very, very wealthy. Abraham, for example, was an extremely wealthy man. And God doesn't necessarily condemn that kind of wealth. But what God does condemn is the way in which wealth is used when it is not used to his glory, when it is not used to his service, when our resources are only used for ourselves, and when we take uh, our, the money that God so graciously grants us and spend it all on us, we have a problem. And James warns these wealthy people who are acting like that, that they're on a per perilous position. He says, weep, wail, mourn. Three words he uses there to describe the attitude they ought to have. And the reason he says, weep, wail, and mourn is because there is a coming judgment. You just cannot escape the eschatological, the end time reality that scripture presents. That God one day is going to set up his judgment throne and all people will stand before God and God will hold every single person to account. And God has set aside a day in eternity when Christ will be revealed, Jesus will return and when Jesus returns, God will raise all who have died, including unbelievers, and all will stand before the judgment throne of God. And James says those who are wealthy and are exploiting their wealth and not using it in the right way will stand condemned. Therefore, they should ought to be weeping and wailing. In other words, James is saying you should be repenting. That's your only hope, to repent. Judgment is coming. And while it's easy in a temporal sense to say, well, judgment is out there. It's far away. You know, it's arm's length. I don't have to think about it. It's going to come sooner than you think. For whether it's through old age or whether it's through some other circumstance in your life, sooner or later, death is going to tap you on the shoulder and it's going to say, it's your time. It's your time. And James talks about judgment not so much in terms of only what is yet to be. Because James is trying to help these readers to understand that they are currently in that day, living in the last days. Now, I want to explain that phrase, the last days. When he talks about weep, wail, and mourn, it's in reference to the fact that they are living in the last days. When Scripture talks and you read throughout the New Testament about the last days, that's not talking about a, a short period just before Christ comes. The last days are inaugurated with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. That set in motion the very last 
things that God is doing, so that we are living now in the last days. James's uh, congregation were living in the last days. And while for us, we might say, but Ian, that's 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years have lapsed between when this was written and where we are now. And if it's supposedly the last days, that's a long period of time. And of course, Peter answers that, doesn't it? He says, with God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So for God, the time frame in which he operates is very different from the time frame in which we operate. God is in the eternal realm. There is no time. There is no beginning. There is no end. It's just eternal. Which raises a number of interesting questions which we won't go to. I don't want to get distracted. But what we need to understand is because those last days have been inaugurated with the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ could happen anytime. So that you and I could be those who are alive when Jesus returns and God sets up his kingdom and judges the living and the dead. Richard Baxter, that Puritan, wrote, It is most lamentable thing to see how most people spend their time and their energy for trifles while God is cast aside. He who is all seems to them as nothing, and that which is nothing seems to them as good as all. It is lamentable indeed knowing that God has set mankind in such a race where heaven or hell is their certain end, that they should sit down and loiter or run after childish toys of the world, forgetting the prize they should run for. Were it but possible for one of us to see this business as an all-seeing God does and see what most men and women in the world are interested in and what they are doing every day, it would be the saddest sight imaginable. Oh, how we should marvel at their madness and lament their self-delusion. If God had never told them what... Uh, what they were sent into the world to do or what he was before them in another world, then there would have been some excuse. But it is his sealed word and they profess to believe it. We only have a limited amount of time and rather than spending it running after wealth, let's spend it running after Christ. And serving him. I look out here and I see a lot of young people. You've got your life before you. I'm coming to the other side of life. I'm getting to the other end. If you're going three score and ten, seventy years, then I haven't got long to go. Some of you, if you live to 70 or 80 or 90, you've got a long time to go. And you've got to decide how you're going to spend those years. What matters? What counts? Pursuing wealth or pursuing Christ? What in eternity will matter? Secondly, I want you to notice the useless hoarding of wealth, verses 2 and 3. The useless hoarding of wealth. Look what he says. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Now, uh, verses 2 and 3. Sorry, let me re just read verse 3. Uh, keep going. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Now, I know there's some metaphors there that are being used that Gold and silver don't rust, but don't read that in a way that is meant to be read so that you just look at it literally rather than seeing and understanding it's a metaphorical way of saying you've taken all this money you've got and you've hoarded it away. You've kept it. You've got so many clothes, James is saying, because what would happen in those days with the wealthy, they wouldn't just change, have a change of clothes once a day. They would have a change of clothes a few times in a day. 
And so you might get dressed in something in the morning, and then you're changed for lunch, and then you're changed for the afternoon and evening. And so you have all these sets of clothes, and they've got accumulated so many clothes that they've taken some of them, and they've hoarded them. They've put them away. They've put them in storage. And what's happened is the moths have come in and begun to eat the clothes. And James says, shame on you for hoarding your wealth. It was an awful sin. They were trusting in something that was unreliable. They were trusting in something that had no eternal gain. They were putting their faith in temporal things that were perishing. And yet all the while, the eternal treasure that they ought to have been building up in heaven, they haven't been given any consideration to. They're outside of the kingdom. They don't even care about God. They're not interested in serving him. It's all about them, as we will see a little bit later on. Their heart was set on wealth. Do you remember the words of Jesus in Luke 12, 34? Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Isn't it interesting the way that that's phrased? Jesus doesn't say, where your heart is, your treasure is. Rather, he says, where your treasure is, your heart will follow it. So if you're about making money or accumulating wealth, your heart will follow that particular focus in your life. And instead of taking the resources that God has blessed them and using those for the kingdom of God as God directs them, they are holding on to it and building up treasure for themselves. And James rebukes them. Thirdly, I want you to see the unjust gain of wealth. Look at verse 4. The unjust gain of wealth. Look, the wages you have failed to pay, the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. It's an interesting phrase that he uses when he speaks about the Lord Almighty. Literally, in the original language, it is the Lord of hosts. And when that phrase is used, it talks about the warrior nature of God. In other words, he's saying to these people, you are exploiting the poor. God is concerned about social justice. I know that sometimes we can get lost and too focused on social justice and somehow lose the gospel and become more concerned about social justice than the gospel. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that God is still concerned about social justice. God is concerned about the poor. God is concerned about how their wages are sometimes used as a means of exploiting their labor. God is concerned when they are underpaid. And when the cries of those poor people come up, they come up to heaven and James says, watch out because the Lord of hosts, the God of armies, the God who is the warrior God, he hears their cries. You're playing with fire. Now, I know at one level we may say, well, that's not such a big problem in Australia. The interesting thing is, if you, were, uh, if you read the newspapers, you will know in February this year, there's a big article in one of the papers about migrant workers up north who work on the farms up north, how they were being exploited because of their status of lack of immigration. They had come here as refugees or they had come here as asylum seekers and they were waiting for their papers to be processed and in the meantime, they were being put to work on the farms and the farmers were exploiting them knowing the precarious position that they were in and not paying them due wages. So even in Australia, we have an issue. It's not just countries outside of this. And God says, I hear the cries of those who've been exploited. In fact, Scripture is very clear about this. Leviticus 19.13. Let me just read some uh, from the Old Testament when I find the right notes. Leviticus 19.13. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. 24.14, do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother Israelite or an alien living among one of your towns. 
pay him the wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to Yahweh against you and you will be guilty of sin. Psalm 14, verse 6. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but Yahweh is their refuge. Psalm 35, 10. My whole being will exclaim, Who is like you, O Yahweh? You rescue the poor from those too strong for them, the poor and the needy from those who rob them. It's not, not a new problem. This is a problem that's been going on for centuries. Now, while you may be sitting here this evening and you may be saying, well, that's not me. I'm not being exploited with my wages. Maybe some of you think you should be, pay, be paid better. I don't know. That's another story. But it should concern us that there are others in this world and even in this country who have been exploited. And if there's one thing Christians should do is we should fight on behalf of those who can't fight on behalf of themselves. Social justice, in other words, should be a concern of ours. We can't just ignore it and because sometimes it's been abused, not be concerned. Fourthly, I want you to notice the decadent spending of the wealth, wealthy. Verse 5, the decadent spending of the wealthy. Look at them. Verse 5. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Now, here James is raising this whole issue that all of us deal with, and that is the, the self-indulgent lifestyles that the advertisers seek to draw us into. We all suffer from this, don't we, in some ex to some extent? The advertisers are extremely good at telling you that you need things, even though they actually are wants, and draw us into their web. And you can justify any purchase. You can. While millions around the world are starving. I've been guilty of it. At times where I've been caught into that web of accumulating things. And then you read appeals of places like the Barnabas Fund, who talk about Christians who have no food, and make a special appeal that you and I would just donate $10 that'll feed a, or $30 that'll feed a family for a month. It's very easy to get caught up in self-indulgent lifestyles. They live for the now. They don't believe in the day of judgment. They don't believe there is a day of judgment. And so if you remove God from the picture, then you can do whatever you want. And that's what they do. Day of judgment, that's pie in the sky. That's just a fable. That's just fanciful thinking. That just doesn't exist. It's not going to happen. And so they continue to live these self-indulgent and last us enjoying their worldly pleasures. But James says judgment is just a heartbeat away. Just a heartbeat. And what we as Christians need to realize, we might not be in the same frame as those unbelievers who live self-indulgent lives, is that whatever God gives us in terms of our wealth, is meant for his glory. Everything you own and everything I own and everything I've been given is a gift of God's grace. And it's not for me simply to take what I have and spend it all on me. I need to come before God and commit my finances to him and pray and say, Lord, give me wisdom. How do you want me to divide my money? How do you want me to use this wealth that you've given me? If it all belongs to you and it all comes from you, then I don't have the right to make that determination independently of you. You know, one Carlos Autos has got a wonderful video. I, can't, I, I, I don't have it, unfortunately, but I have the transcript from it where he talks about this. 
me read the transcript. So when a man finds Jesus, it costs him everything. Jesus has happiness, joy, peace, healing, security, eternity. Man marvels at such pearls and says, I want this pearl. How much does it cost? The seller says, it's too dear. It's too costly. But how much? Well, it's very expensive. Do you think I could buy it? Well, it costs everything you have. No more, no less. So anybody can buy it. I'll buy it. Well, what do you have? Let's write it down. I have 10,000 in the bank. Good, 10,000. What else? I have nothing more. That's all I have. Have you nothing more? Well, I have a few dollars here in my pocket. How many? I'll see. 30, 40, 50, 80, 100, 120, 120 dollars. That's fine. What else do you have? I have nothing else. That's all. Where do you live? I live in my house. The house too. Then you mean I must live in the garage. Have you got a garage too? That too. What else? Do you mean I must live in my car then? Have you got a car? I have two. Both become mine. Both cars. What else? Well, you have my house, the garage, the cars, the money, everything. What else? Are you alone in the world? No, I have a wife and two children. Your wife and children too. Them too? Yes, everything you have. What else? I have nothing else. I'm left alone now. Oh, you too. Everything becomes mine. Wife, children, house, money, cars, everything. And you too. Now you can use those things here, but don't forget they're mine as you are. And when I need any of those things you are using, you must give them to me because I am now the owner. Does God own you like that? When God says to you, I need your car, you give it to him. When God says to you, I need your house, will you give it to him? When God says to you, I want to send you as a missionary overseas, will you bow to him and say, send me? When God says, I want you to engage in ministry in the church, will you argue with him and fight with him? Or will you surrender and say, yep. When you come to Christ, he pulls no punches. He doesn't. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And when you bring yourself to that point of submission to Christ, you surrender everything. Sometimes it's very, very costly. Sometimes the Lord says, you know, I'm going to take your husband or wife. Don't you take your child? That's very painful. But if it's surrender to him, then you and I won't argue. Yes, it won't lessen the pain. but we'll understand that he gave everything for us. And I can never repay him for that. Not ever. And so he ends by saying, the ruthless exploitation of wealth, look at verse 6. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. In other words, you have exploited the poor to such an extent that some of them have lost their livelihood and have died. And though you may not have literally murdered them by plunging a weapon or a knife into them, you have, in the equivalent, killed them by denying them the ability to earn a living. And you stand condemned. 
you have denied them justice in the courts. You have stolen their land. And so James very graphically deals with this issue that you and I, even though we may not fit into the unbeliever category, struggle with in terms of our wealth. And he confronts us and he says to us, and it's very confronting, in preparing this passage, I had to spend some time confessing. I did. Because you and I get caught up into wealth without even realizing it. Because we're so wealthy. There are people in the world who will never own a car, ever. They won't even own a bicycle. And the way they get from A to B is by walking. And some of them don't have shoes. And so they develop hard calluses on their feet because they walk on all kinds of surfaces. So when you and I think about getting in a car and sitting in a car and traveling somewhere, we don't think, well, this is a symbol of wealth. But it is for some. And the problem is not that we have that wealth. The problem is some coming to God and saying, yes, Lord, you've given us, you've blessed us in an incredible way. You've put us in Australia. What a blessing to live in Australia. What an incredible privilege to live in Australia. We, we, we haven't grown up in a country where we've experienced hunger, famine, where we, we don't have enough money to buy food, or, or where if we don't have a job, we don't eat and we die out of starvation because we have a center link that catches up. Yeah, yes, Lord, we, we've been blessed by living in this wealthy country, but Lord, help us, give us the ability to use whatever you've given us for your kingdom. Lord, don't let us squander our lives. Don't let us waste our lives, Lord. Help us not to become obsessed with accumulating things. Help us not to become obsessed with having a nice big house. Or, or whatever. And it's not wrong to have a big house. Please don't misunderstand me. But if that becomes the obsession, if that becomes the goal of our life, if that becomes the purpose for which we exist, God is saying, no, no, no. You need to have different purposes to that. And if I bless you with wealth, and some of you are going to be blessed with great wealth, praise God for that. But your reason for being blessed with wealth is so that you may take that wealth and bless others. And some in this church who are wealthy have done exactly that. They have. We have wealthy people in this church who have blessed others with their wealth and used their wealth sacrificially for God's service. They know who they are. And it's been wonderful to see. They've understood this whole concept. But some of you are younger here this evening. You're not there yet. And some of you are going to be wealthy. But can I encourage you, get your priorities right. Make your life count for God. It's more important that we build up heavenly wealth than earthly wealth. Where moth rust comes in and where thieves come in and steal, where it decays, where it ruins. Don't spend your energy, don't spend your life running and pursuing those things. Pursue things that are going to build heavenly treasure. I want to end with a, 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 a true story, and then I'm done. A few years ago, Erica felt led to begin an after-school program for the young people in her area. What started out as a one afternoon per week opportunity to play pool in the North Park Recreation Lounge has expanded to include a full range of options for junior high and senior high school students, including academic assistance and a youth ministry program. Erica calls it After Hours. And the program has been recognized, this is in America, by Senator Paul Simon and the President Clinton. In 96, Erica was invited to fly to Washington to meet with President Clinton, where the After Hours program was recognized as one of the best volunteer programs in America. One student who heard Erica address the class gave this account. 
I know that I have the desire to find passion as Erica has found. She helped me to have this desire to seek out my passion so that I can get to the stage where I can live it. Erica pointed out in the pas- out a passage of compassion um, that she felt summarized the challenges that she confronted with. It relates to the command given to us by Jesus. Be compassionate as your heavenly Father is compassionate. This command does not restate the obvious. Something we already wanted but had forgotten. An idea in line with our national aspirations. On the contrary, it is a core that goes right against the grain. That turns us completely around and requires a total conversion of heart and mind. It is indeed a radical core. A core that goes to the root of my lives. From what I know about Erica, she could have done anything. She shared how some people back home questioned her judgment because of her choice of occupation. And she, she was told she would grow out of it. I think she has lived firsthand what the passage is talking about. She has gone against the grain, against that upward pull towards fame, riches, and higher positions. I can see what a radical call it really is. And as a graduation day approaches, it seems all the more radical. My tendencies are to look towards jobs that will make the most money so that I can fill my life with things. Erica's example has challenged me to find something more meaningful, something that requires a total conversion of heart and mind. Society encourages us to go upward. By upward direction, I mean striving for things like better salaries, more prestigious positions. The downward pull that compassion refers to is what Jesus' life reflected. Instead of striving for a higher position, more power, and more influence, Jesus moves from the hearts to the depths, from victory to defeat, from riches to poverty, from crimes to suffering, from life to death. Don't you want to make your life count? Really count? Really mean something? then when you come and you surrender it to Jesus, give it all to him. Don't hold back. Strive for those things that will build up heavenly treasure that will last for all eternity. Don't get seduced by the world into thinking that wealth will bring you contentment. Only Jesus does. And the privilege and the honor of being engaged in serving him is the greatest honor that any of us can ever experience in this world. And we don't do it to receive accolades. We don't do it to receive praise. We do it to glorify the one who gave everything for us. Young people, make your life count. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you this evening and we recognize that sometimes we get so distracted by all that glitters. The striving after things can be so compelling at times and at times so subtle that we don't even recognize we've been caught into its pull and deceived into its core. But I pray that you would help us to see the glory of serving the Lord Jesus Christ, of surrendering to him, of casting ourselves at his feet. And if he chooses to bless us with wealth, then may we be directed to using that for his glory. I pray that you would help those who are here this evening. Some, Lord, you are going to call into ministry somewhere. Some you are going to thrust out into faraway lands. Some you are going to cause to be servants right here in Australia. And some of those older ones who are sitting here have left a legacy for them to follow, have shown what serving Christ looks like, have demonstrated what generosity looks like. I pray that they would follow in their footsteps. I pray mostly they would follow in your footsteps. 
you who did not seek to be served, but to serve and give your life a ransom for many. May you thrust them out into this world that seeks so much pleasure to live self-sacrificial, self-denying lives. That when finally you bring their lives to a close and they enter into eternity, they may hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. For Jesus' sake. Amen.